built this up all year, I've trained for this all year, I've talked about it you know, at work all year, and I was thinking, I don't know that I'll be able to finish this. Yeah, my name's Tayson. I'm the founder and CEO here at Outdoor Vitals. We're an ultralight backpacking company that really push ourselves and push the limits here to innovate on products, but also to inspire others to get out on trail more comfortably and more confidently. I initially started to run for two reasons. The first and foremost was to just cover more mileage in the time that I had personally. A lot of times I'm getting out on three-day weekends or during the work week here at the office. And so the farther I could go, the more trails that would open up to me. And so Basically, I'd started to learn about fast packing and I got motivated to try to do more miles on trail. And so I started to train a little bit there and it wasn't very long into that that I started to see the physical benefits of running as well. And it just kind of spiraled into me continuing to run. After my first season of running and fast packing, I got more motivated to try something like an ultra. I specifically picked an ultra marathon because I have done a handful of, you know, 26 plus mile days backpacking. I've done fast packing trips where we're doing over 26 miles a day. And so something like a marathon just wasn't as motivating to me. I was thinking I'd do something like a 50K, which is you know just a little bit over 30 miles, uh, but unfortunately it didn't shake out that way and I bit off a little more than that. I chose the Tusher 70K race for a couple of reasons. I love the Tusher Mountains. I've spent a lot of time there. It was a close race for me. This, the, the dates worked out pretty well. And I was just, I just really wanted to run on that mountain. I, I'm very attracted to going into, into high elevation settings, and this is a high elevation trail race. And so when I went to sign up for it, they didn't have a 50K, they only had a marathon and a 70K. And literally when I first found out about this uh, race that had even existed, we were fast packing through that mountain range and we were seeing like the booths that were set up and we talked to some people that were doing it and we were thinking, hey, we're doing 26 miles a day fast packing. Um, and so when it came to this, I was like, if I sign up for a 26 mile race, the marathon, it won't be that motivating. And the only tier up from there was the 70K. And so I signed up for it as I got farther into it and started to look at it more closely, how far it was, but mainly the elevation profile, I realized that this was going to be perhaps more than I could handle. I was feeling nervous. As I had talked to people the night before, I had found out that almost everyone that was running my race had run multiple, multiple uh, <laughs> races. So we ran rim to rim to rim in the Grand Canyon. We fast packed it in May and I came away from that injured. My knee was hurting a lot, but specifically the front part of my shin that you use a lot when you're going down hills quickly um, was, was kind of messed up and that was really translating into my knee and it took me a while to figure out what was going on and to work on that but what that did is through the month of June my training was was massively derailed so I wasn't getting some of those bigger miles day, days that I wanted to and, and had planned to uh, but I specifically remember my last workout before the race uh, I did a, a run over here that was it's about nine miles and you climb over about 2,000 feet or 2,200 feet of elevation and descend and I ran it with no pain and I thought Okay, good. Like I'm, I, hopefully I'm ready for this race. I thought there'd be more people kicking around right now. There's supposed to be 120 people, I think, in. So, what time does the race actually start? Six, so 15 minutes or so. And how many miles is it? 43.2 or something. 70k, 12, almost 13,000 feet of climbing. I just sleep decent, but according to my watch, I'm still pretty, uh, was not the best sleep and my body battery is still pretty low. So but that kind of happens at elevation. So as we're waiting for the race, you know, it's, it's one of those moments where you're, where you're just trying to figure out like where to put your head at that moment in time. Like, where are you? Uh, thankfully, you know, my wife was there, Joe was there with me. And so I had just some people to kind of talk to, but you're trying to think about, okay, like run your race. Move up closer for me. All the way up to the boom now. Come on into the corral here. Get some ladies on the front line. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. So in this race, you start at Eagle Point Ski Resort, and then you run about eight miles to All Unite Aid Station. That's the unsupported aid station. From there, you drop back down and then turn around and climb straight up and over the tallest peak on the mountain range. It's actually the third highest mountain range in the state of Utah. So you crest at 12,200 feet, and then you drop back down and climb back up to Mud Lake. 
where there's another aid station and you're about 16 miles in at that point. From there, we actually drop off another side to a lake called Blue Lake. It's a beautiful lake. From there, we climb out of Blue Lake up to Bullion Pasture where we have another aid station that my wife could get to and support me there. I drop down from there and that from, from that aid station, right? So you're, you're uh, 20 something miles in at that point. It's a straight descent all the way down another eight miles to the next aid station where we're at about 30 miles in. You hit an aid station at Miners Park and this is the last aid station you get on the day uh, where, where your family members and whatnot can come and support you. So you meet there and then from there you do this massive climb of well over 3,000 feet just straight up and out uh, to climb back to the All Unite aid station. Take care of yourself and then you finish the race by going back down that same first eight miles that you started on. So I'm a pretty big planner and when it came to this, I had planned out my time that I thought it would take me to get to each aid station. Um, I looked at the elevation profiles, I looked at the miles, and even took into consideration a little bit of how far in the race we were sitting at. And I had mapped out basically a range of how long I thought it would take me to get from point A to point B all at every step throughout this whole race. So with those plans in place, my goal is to finish at 8 p.m. that night. That would mean that I got to finish in the daylight, which was something I wanted to do. I didn't want to be running at night. I knew that would be really strenuous, but I also thought it was something I could handle. Finally, you know, the whistle blows. I, I, I didn't know what to do. Some of these people just start walking. Some of them start running. And I'm just like, I don't know. I'm just gonna try to run my race, I guess. So I, I kind of start jogging out. I'm trying to be very patient. And it's a really interesting situation for someone who's never run because you have people in front of you that are running slow. You have people in, in behind you that are running fast. And you're trying to figure out like, do I let people pass me? Do I pass people? Cause you can't run the pace that you want to run because you're in this line. That first four miles was just very awkward, very weird for me and a lot of doubt of like, you know, just constant like, am I running, am I running the right speed, you know, and I'm, you're trying to gauge other people. And that, that was, you know, that was just something that, that I shouldn't have been doing. I should have just been looking at myself and running my race versus looking at other people and thinking, hey, why is that guy passing me? I, I can probably keep up, you know, or any, anything like that. Just, just get in my own groove. But thankfully too, there was also some distant family members that I'd found out the, the night before were also running this race. And so at about mile six, um, those family members kind of caught back up to me and I started to chat with them and, and I and I started to, uh, you know, I guess just get lost in that. And, and those miles clicked off pretty dang fast and seamless and just felt like I was in a good spot until I got to that All United Aid Station. So rolling into that first aid station, most of these guys are just filling up two flasks and they're out of there. And I'm over here like, kind of undoing my bag and trying to fill up a water bladder. But I pulled my water bladder out and my heart sunk because I saw how much water was still in there. And I knew that according to all of the research and things that I'd done, I should have drank pretty much all of my water there. I mean, ideally I drank all the water I took between starting the race and that position. And I had probably drinking less than half of the water that I brought. Oh man, I shouldn't have been talking. I got behind on hydration. I got distracted. I let I let you know the, these external factors affect my race already. And so I filled up the water and I started to go out. And right away after I had kind of stopped at that aid station, been crouching down, moving, it felt different. And there was a climb that we, you know, we climb up to this pass and drop off the other side. By the time I got to the top of that climb and I was sitting at probably nine miles, I started to cramp up. As soon as I started to descend off the other side, it was again that front shin area of my legs. I just couldn't believe I was, you know, nine miles into this race starting to cramp up, we're dropping down below, and then I gotta turn around and climb back up Delano. Um, and, you know, and I'm, I'm just so, it, I, was, I was very overwhelmed. Thankfully, a friend of mine that, that we work with here at Dr. Vital said that, that's run a handful of these, had said, you know, you're gonna have low points in your race, and just remember they can come at any time, and they will always fade. Get down to the bottom of this section, and I start to climb, and my gut's kind of feeling weird, uh, my legs are hurting and I, I'm just feeling like, like I'm not running the race at this point that I wanted to. I wasn't able to climb like I wanted to. I was already low on calories. Um, so I was kind of feeling a bit of a calorie wall as I was coming up the Lano and, and I was stopping a lot more than I wanted to, but made it up to Lano, kind of got to the top. Everyone's partying and happy and whatnot. There's like marathon runners that had, that had got up there on a shorter trail and they're all happy and, and I'm just like, if I bet if they looked at me, I probably looked like I was like pissed off, you know? But I, I took it in for just a second up there and I started down. And as soon as I started down again, the other side, just 
instant pain. And I'm watching these people that I climbed up the mountain with take off running and they're just like, oh, this is the easy stuff, right? This is where I just, I mean, they're just flying down the trail. And here I am, I'm walking and I'm limping, I'm hobbling, I'm putting so much pressure on those trekking poles. As I keep going down, I continue to cramp and so I start stopping. And I stop and I'm trying to roll out, you know, those muscles with my, my trekking pole and that's helping a little bit and I get up and I walk down a little farther and pretty soon people started to stop when, I, when they'd pass me and say, hey, are you all right? Did you fall down? You know what I mean? Like, why are you stopped on the downhill? Is, is, I mean, that, that's what I would be asking someone too. And it's, you know, typically downhill, you're, everyone's doing good on the downhill. It's the uphill where everyone's talking and stopping and, and in pain. But me, it was these downhills. And so for about a mile to a mile and a half going down to Lano, I had to stop four to five different times. I mean, completely stop, sit down on the ground, you know, try to work these muscles out. And I finally get down to the bottom and I'm like, I'm struggling. I am like mentally beat down and keep, and at this point we're like 12 miles in, I think, something like that, maybe 13. And I start to walk down the road because you tee into a road and you walk this road for about a mile up to what's called Mud Lake where the next aid station is. And I start going and I don't get very far up the trail before I run into uh, some cousins and aunts and uncles that I didn't know were gonna be there. They looked very concerned. <laughs> and me, I'm like, I'm like excited to see him. I'm also just like in all this pain. And so I'm going through these different emotions of like, holy cow, what are you guys doing here? Like, this is so cool. You came, you know, to help, you know, to support me. And, and, and uh, you know, they were same family members that had these other, that were related to these distant family members that are running it as well. And so it was just really cool to see them up there. But they, I'm, like, I'm looking at their face and they're like, are you okay? Because they had been watching through uh, binoculars and things and they'd seen me stopping the whole way down this big long ridge. I was thinking, I don't know that I'll be able to finish this. And th that's crazy, right? Like I've built this up all year, I've trained for this all year. I've talked about it, you know, at work all year. And uh, what if I can't even finish this race? I was getting emotional. At 15 and a half miles in, I get to the Mud Lake aid station and this was the most pivotal aid station for me in the whole race. I was struggling a lot. I was cramping up a lot. Um, but when I got to this aid station, my entire family was there. Daddy! What's up, buddy? Be careful, run the chewing, honey. Yeah. Hey, buddy. You want your hair gun? What do you have on your nose? Thing to help me breathe but it's falling off. And I'm gonna put those compression things on my calves are okay. dying. Hi, baby. This race is gonna go probably past your being awake, dude. Okay. For me, at least. <laughs> I'm gonna go back home. To camp. Oh, to camp? Grandma's gonna take you to camp after we take care of that. Oh, boy. Yeah. Cramping, just trying to get those on. When you mix that up, yeah. can you do three of the hyper scratches in yep. there. I've been cramping since mile 10, we're at 16. Oh. I did not expect, I think, to get the boost in morale and the motivation that I did at that aid station. So I'm sitting there, I'm talking with them, my, my spirits are lightening, uh, I get the, the socks on my legs and it just right away felt good and I was really impressed by that. I've been thinking, Joe, why I, uh, Run these? Uh, you need yeah. the blue ones. I think it's because I'm bad at them. <laughs> I think I like doing something that I'm not naturally good at. Getting the trash kicked. I would take all my estimates and kick them back. I am reassessing my goals. Thankfully at this aid station, I did the most pivotal thing I did in the day with my hydration and food. I doubled my salt. So I took my already high salt levels that I was planning on taking and I put in twice as much. And I just felt like I had to get in front of these cramps. So I restocked up on everything and there was a storm coming in. And so it was like, okay, it's it's really, it's time to get out of here and, and push on the race. Hey, good luck. Good job, babe. Thanks. Think you need a longer rest than that? Say good That's luck, too long. <laughs> Cheer for you, Thanks. Daddy. We'll see you. Good luck, Daddy. Good luck. Good luck. Good luck. Good luck. Good luck. Yeah. Bye. I've lost my friend. Bye, Daddy. You have to cross the starter again. Or... I want to say it was probably on a, you know seven miles or less between this section and, and the next aid station. And I start walking and you know, it's painful. I'm, I'm walking, it's painful. And I'm trying to drink, you know, just a little bit, but, but already your stomach's, you know, churning. 
And I happened to have uh, a runner from the 100K, you know, that had talked to me the night before at our booth. He swung right in behind me and said, dude, I'm at like the lowest point right now in this 100K. And uh, we just started walking and we just started talking and we talked about all sorts of things. We probably walked together for a mile, maybe a mile and a half. And then he said, hey, I think I'm feeling a little bit better. I'm gonna start running again. And so he started running again. And uh, <clears throat> I you know, followed along for a little bit and then suddenly I was feeling better and I started to run a little bit as well. In this section here, I dropped down to Blue Lake, which is one of the most beautiful parts of the entire course. And at the bottom of Blue Lake, you basically get there and you start climbing right back out to Bullion Pasture. I've been able to maintain a acceptable pace, I'll say, and spirits are lifted. It's really good to see family and friends and whatnot at the aid station and change the outlook on the day. Try to hold this steady, almost more of a hiking pace than a running pace, we'll see. And uh, try to make it to the end. So pretty. I love this area. Oh, you're killing it. So are you. The downhills are fine. Oh, you're lucky. <laughs> The climbs where I stop feeling hey, hey, how's it going? like I'm gonna puke. Oh, <laughs> I trade you. My knees and my 200 pound frame disagree. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I was going so slow down Delano, my watch quit recognizing the pace. <laughs> it's like, I hate that when it's like, you need to pause. <laughs> yeah, are you yeah. still working out? Coming out of there, I started to just push and, and power hike up this big long climb, and I was able to make some passes and, and just felt like. I was like really moving on the trail. So I was feeling really good and then and then I also realized I said, well, I, the last thing I said to Bree was take all my times and push them way back. So do I even have a crew member here, you know? And and so anyways, I, I walked in to what they were calling Little Hawaii or some kind of tropical getaway because they're all wearing, you know, lay, you know, flower lays and they're all partying and I'm, you know, just st struggling along in this race. Doing a little better, Joe. <laughs> These leg sleeves and hydration made all of the difference. Thankfully, right before we got there, Bree had arrived, and so you know my my food and stuff was there that I could I could switch out. Um, make it triple again. That made a big difference. Okay. It's like syrup. It's so thick, but it is saving. Oh. Thank Pretend everyone's cheering for me. <laughs> People are gonna ask where to get the OV shorts. <laughs> they are in development. It's a good test. Maybe there's hope to still finish before dark. We'll see. We'll be there. Yeah. Yeah. Running's not a big part of my family. None of my relatives really ran except for my grandfather. He used to run against race against quarter horses and bet on him on his feet in the quarter horse for a distance. I don't know how it turned out, but he must have been fast back then. I can hardly walk these trails, let alone run these trails. It's uh, impressive. I'm glad he can challenge his body and his body responds to the challenge. And he gets a chance to see a lot of country that I'll never see. I'm not in that kind of shape, and I don't think I ever could. <laughs> yeah, he wasn't a runner. I think when he just got into this um, outdoor vital stuff, he just kind of had a love for the outdoors. I can't imagine him not finishing, just knowing Jason. Mm -hmm. He told me on the phone, I'll cross that finish line, I'll walk, I'll run, or I may crawl, but I'll finish it. <laughs> I have been traveling, station to first aid station to first aid station, uh, making sure he's okay. Some mornings I would just wake up, like look around for Tayson, and if I just opened my email, it would say, watch Tayson's journey on Garmin, and I would just click on uh, that link and see where he's running for that morning, and I'd just, look at it and I'm like, oh, he's at mile eight. That's great, when's he turning around? That's 16 miles. It was probably the most runnable section of the entire race. Trail was pretty good condition, you know, gradual downhill, very, very runnable. I know it was runnable because I saw a 100K guy fly past me. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm over here and I would try to run and I'd get about 10 steps in and the pain would be so great in my lower legs that I would just have to stop, I couldn't. So most of this section really consisted of me power hiking, but I also remember very distinctly in this section, 
realizing that I had made a pretty dang big mistake with my hydration. Make it triple again, that made a big difference. Make it triple again, triple again. Everything in my bag was super salty. It had tons of electrolytes in it. And I didn't wanna drink anything as I was going down, but I knew I needed to be drinking things because every time I'd pass a new stream, I would just wanna stop and drink out of the stream. The crystal clear water with nothing mixed into it looked so, so good. I made an on-call adjustment during the race, which was just fine, but I should have gone back to neutral. And because I didn't, now I'm getting over salted and under hydrated um, with every step along the path down. You're killing it, man. Freaking killing it. So I get down to the bottom here and it was the last stop that Bree could come in and crew me for. And so that was kind of nerve wracking because she'd been super helpful this whole time and just very efficient. She had it down, she knew what, how to you know mix up the drinks I needed, knew like where everything was at. And so it was just very efficient and, and comforting to go into these aid stations. Uh, but I knew this was the last one. So I get down there though, and I'm not feeling super great. Climbed 7,000 feet and it's done 29.3 miles. That's amazing. Yeah. I think I've descended though 9,200 feet today. That's like worse than the climb. I don't know. Down is just pain and up is fatigue so just pick your poison. I'm starting to feel like my stomach's gonna become something like I need more calories but I don't want to take them. These are saving my life but but this is still really hard. My stomach was just in ruins. Like I, I couldn't even think about eating anything. I was trying to drink stuff, I couldn't. Um, I drank like, I remember drinking one, you know, flask full of just plain water. And then I had Brie give me like a Coke and I couldn't drink, I couldn't even drink the Coke. Like it like tasted too salty, too thick. And this guy approaches me from the aid station and he says, hey, aren't you the guy that's always on my, you know, YouTube feed or, or something like, I don't know. And I'm like, yeah, that's me, you know? And, and he's like, yeah, I know exactly where I've got your pillow and I've got some of your gear and this and that. And he's like, you can't be laying here, man. Like, you gotta get up, you're gonna start cramping up. And he's like, have you eaten anything? And he runs over and gets me a bowl of food. And he's like, just force it down. And I, I force about half of a bowl of pasta down. And then he, you know, you know, his words kind of stuck with me of just like, the longer you sit here, the more likely you are to cramp. You know, and I'm like, all I want to do is sit here. I don't want to get up because this is, the next section is the crux of the race. I didn't add any salt to a lot of my stuff. I just refilled um, like my water bladder and some of those pieces. Really, I was, I was feeling pretty dang low. Um, I had started to notice coming into that aid station that my face was feeling kind of tingly. I remember asking Brie if she could see my face twitching at all or doing anything weird, you know? And, and she said no, that she couldn't. I was in a really, really weird spot. Um, but I knew I got 16 more miles left and this next section is gonna be rough. Physically, I was feeling okay, but I was not feeling okay with hydration and, and any kind of food. I just could not eat food. I'll get all those, you got batteries and stuff? Yeah. What you need? Yeah, okay. okay, will you tell them I'm out? Thank you. Hey, thanks for being a customer. All right, you're <laughs> thanks all for all the help here. Go for it. Get it. Eventually, I get back on my feet from Miners Park and I start up the crux of this race, which is just a massive, massive climb. Pretty much, you are climbing for the next seven ish miles to get up to the, the All Unite Aid Station again. And I actually tucked in behind some, some 100K runners that were probably in the top 10 or 20 uh, runners in that race. And, you know, I was just following them up the whole thing. As I was going, I kept thinking, like, don't look at your watch, don't see how much, you know, elevation you've climbed, like, just keep your nose down and just keep going. And after I was like, okay, I've gotta be like 80, 90% of the way up this climb. I looked down at my watch and look at the elevation and I like, don't believe it. I check it again, I check it again. And sure enough, I was only about halfway up this climb. So I continued to hike a little bit further and it wasn't very long before I hit into a massive calorie wall. And a calorie wall is essentially when you've burned all of the energy that you've got available to your body um, to burn. And when you hit that point, basically your energy levels just tank. And so I went from doing 
you know, 20 minute miles while climbing up this big steep grade to having those miles jump to 30 minute miles just like that. Holy cow, like I need to eat food, I can't eat food, I feel like I'm gonna throw up, I, I'm in like, like just everything's churning and, and I feel like I need to drink water. And that was another thing that just, I couldn't believe I'd done this again, which was, I, you know, even though I did not add additional electrolytes into my pack, because that solution had become so salty over the course of us adding more and adding more throughout the day, and because we didn't dump it out and start fresh, there was still a ton of salt in my water bladder and my flasks. And so again, I'm walking past these streams that are crystal clear and I'm just wanting to drink the water there. And, you know, I really wish that I had. Um, but I was, you know, just nervous about, you know, maybe getting sick or something. But eventually I got into the All United Aid station and I'm sitting there and this other guy comes in and he's a guy that was running the 100K. And you could tell he's a seasoned runner. I mean, very fit looking. He would clearly run a bunch of these and he's like, oh, I'm in a bad place. Like, and he's freaking out. And he's, he's one of the guys that I think was talking out of nervousness. Like he talks more when he's nervous, whereas I think I shut down. So I'm just sitting here listening to him while I'm like, freaking out about like, what do I need? What can I eat that will like, that I can actually put down? What can I drink? And he starts like shaking, like physically shaking. And, and he's like, you know, he's, I don't know what he, what was going on with him. He's getting really cold and he's like, I can't sit here. Like I've got to, I've got to go. Like I'm in a really bad place. And it's like, and, and then he just like gets up and takes off. And I'm like, everything that guy said is exactly how I'm feeling. I was realizing at that point, I wasn't going to be able to finish in the daylight. Um, I was realizing that I did not bring um, enough food to go the next section. In my haste and you know hazy memory and, and, and whatever, I had brought enough food to get from that the last aid station to this one, but I didn't have enough to get to the other section. So I had a bag of gummies was it. And then I got like a peanut butter jelly or something from the table there. Um, and I should have grabbed more, but I when I was there, I, I just couldn't eat. And so I'm like, what does it matter if I take it? Like I can't eat it anyways, right? And so eventually I get up and I had, I had also realized at this point that with the facial twitching, my speech had started to slur tremendously. So even though I wanted to talk to some of these people, I, I felt like I couldn't. It was, it was a really weird sensation where um, I could think what I wanted to speak but it was like I couldn't say it. And then when I would try, my speech would, would slur and, and I wasn't pronouncing things right. And so I got up to leave and I went to tell the, the, the ladies there that were running the aid station that I was checking out. And I, all I wanted to say was like, hey, I'm leaving, thanks so much for your help. And I said, hey, I'm leaving and it was so slurred and I was like embarrassed by it um, that I just like turned and left. And I, I, I just remember distinctly feeling like that was really weird. Why can't I talk? Why is my face twitching? And how am I gonna do the next eight miles? Yeah, this section was blurred. I don't really remember hardly anything other than hearing in the distance the finish line like roar when people, when someone would come in, people would cheer and you know clap and whistle and yell and and I remember thinking like, oh, I can hear that, like I'm getting close, you know. And then like you'd hike for like another what felt like 30 minutes and you'd like hear it again. You're like, hey, I can hear it. I must be getting close, you know. After like three times of that, you're like, why am I not to the finish line yet? You know, like this is just ridiculous, but. I think it was at about 11 o'clock is when I got to the finish line. You know, my family's there. It was pretty, it was pretty special. It was like, it was, it was one of those moments where half of me is saying, congratulations, you finished this. The other half is saying like, 
how could you mess up this race this bad, you know? And But I was just thinking, I don't know that I ever need to do this ever again in my life. <laughs> Initially, I'd set out to finish in the daylight. That was like goal one. Goal two was to finish, you know, more like 8 p.m. at night. And so obviously I, I blew past both of those pretty significantly. Getting there at 11 p.m. I think was, was a little bit of that anticlimactic moment of like, well, I missed some of those goals, but I did finish. And now that I've done this and I know how hard it is, I can be pretty proud of just finishing. So starting out this race, there was 120 runners and I finished somewhere in the 70s range. I think it was like 73 or something like that, which um, I was actually surprised by when I found that out just because I thought I was like, dead last or like dang near dead last by the end of this but I think there's a lot of people that, that drop out um, I think that actually finished it it was probably closer to a hundred individuals that, that actually finished the 70k once I got to the finish line and sat down my speech started to go downhill like at a faster rate and I realized like I didn't really have control over my facial muscles so like I couldn't smile hey I'm happy to see you and I want to talk with you but like I'm trying to smile right now and then my face isn't working, my words aren't working. I had the shakes for about 16 miles. I don't know if you can tell, but like talking, I feel like I'm, something's not quite right. I am glad that I did it. Despite what I said that night of, I did it, I'll never have to do it again. But the next day, my mind was already like spinning about all the things that I could have done differently. I could have fixed my hydration. I could have gone back to neutral. I could have, you know, had some of these plans. I could have planned the aid station times better. I could have, um, all these things, my head is spinning. And literally by two days after, I was in my head saying, yeah, I'm gonna have to go back and run it next year and run the race that I planned to run from the beginning. Okay, group, come out of the last aid station. <clears throat> A peanut butter jelly sandwich. I got like one bite of it and just dropped it in the dirt. I'm like, no. So most people know me for backpacking and doing all of this running is pretty counterintuitive to that. But I would argue that a lot of backpackers um, could become better backpackers or have better experiences on trail by running. Learn how to fuel right, learn how to hydrate right, avoid things like elevation sickness, but also just on the day-to-day -day doing a little bit of running is the absolute best way that I've found to condition your body for backpacking. And so I see these two as very parallel paths. I still run to this day to train for backpacking. Backpacking is still my primary hobby and, and love, but running has really conjoined with that well, and I would highly recommend others run, even if their primary goal is to backpack. Now that this race is over and I've had some time to sit and think on it, um, I would recommend this race to others or, or to go and do something similar to this just for what's on the other side. A big reason, the biggest reason that I spend so much time in nature is for things like, you know, physical, mental, emotional health. And finishing a race like this was a growth opportunity for me. It did change me in some way. And I think it's these little changes over time that allow you to, to to constantly have the right perspectives in your life, to know what's most important. Of that whole race, um, you know what was what was the thing that stood out the most? Um, I don't. Know, I would probably say it was the Mud Lake Aid Station, where I had my family members there with me, um, watching, having my boy and my little girl watch me do something that difficult for me. Um, was a pretty powerful experience in hoping to teach them, but also just show me like, like <clears throat> keep perspective for me on what is the most important and to me it's family. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that was the last of it. Unless you want me to say that any different. No, we can, we can leave it at that.